Naomi Wolf is considered one of the most important figures of third wave feminism. Her book, The Beauty Myth, describes beauty as a complete social construct in that the patriarchy determines the content of that construction with the objective to maintain women's subjugation. Wolf was beloved by the left, and that changed in 2020 when she was speaking out against the lockdown as she saw the steps to a totalitarian state that she previously identified in her 2007 book, The End of America. I came from deep, deep, deep in the world of liberal left-wing uh, kind of New York, Washington, I'll just say it, elites. Um, and the world of liberal Washington, New York legacy media, or also known as mainstream media. I didn't, I, I didn't start there. I came from a, you know, very, um, scruffy middle-class background, but through education and I was a Rhodes Scholar and I wrote a bunch of bestsellers and I found myself a fixture for 35 years as kind of the media, a media darling on the left. I also, I will confess to you, because you are tolerant people, advised uh, Bill Clinton's re-election campaign and also was an advisor to Vice President Al Gore in his campaign for the presidency. So deep, deep, deep blue and deep, deep, deep kind of um, bubble, the bubble of where all those ideas and messages are, are incubated and propagated on the left. And I didn't know how wrong some of my ideas were. And you don't know that in that bubble because that bubble is so um, hegemonic and so uh, um, perfected in its self-referential, um, suffocating uh, reflection of itself eternally. It's a bubble without escape. Christina Haas Summers had a similar experience. She saw that academic feminism became a strand of Marxism and Summers wanted to defend a liberal version of feminism. She was surprised by the reaction of her colleagues. Summers says, people were angry at me. I lost a friend. I was excommunicated from a church I didn't know existed. When I was like a baby feminist, I must've been in my twenties, I had an interview with Lou Rockwell and I'd never talked to a libertarian before. And this is an amazing archival document because in one, I don't know, half hour, 40 minute conversation, I literally, he literally, he didn't, he was very gentle, uh, but he literally made me reconsider the foundational basis of my consciousness. And in this, in this interview, you can hear me rethinking and, and thinking, well, maybe, maybe there's a whole other world here about which I know nothing. And it's a world of freedom. And it's, it, and especially I felt this incredible sense of, um, anticipation that there was a universe of freedom, intellectual freedom, uh, social freedom, um, institutional freedom, that I was glimpsing, that no one had ever showed me before. And it was intoxicating. Um, but, you know, the decades went on and I wasn't surrounded by people like that. And I never, I never saw that glimpse again. Then the pandemic hit and, you know, I wrote a book in 2008 called The End of America, in which I looked at history and identified what tyrants do, whether they're on the left or on the right, when they want to close down an open society. And they always do the same 10 things. They always take the same 10 steps. And I was seeing, starting in March of 2020, if I pace, does my audio go with me? Yes. Starting in March of 2020, I was seeing one, two, three, four, all these 10 steps locking together in a way that was utterly recognizable to me from studying Mussolini's Italy, Hitler's Germany, uh, you know, the, the countries behind the Iron Curtain during the 1950s, Argentina, China. This was classic totalitarianism. Um, 
putting itself in place. And, and I was astonished because most people around me couldn't see it and didn't recognize it. But I knew perfectly well from having written The End of America, which the left cheered because it was written during the Bush era, so the bad guys were Republicans at that time. Um, I knew perfectly well that when my Democrat uh, governor, Andrew Cuomo, in New York State, declared a state of emergency in June and said that we couldn't have more than six people in our homes at one time, that that was step 10. That's martial law, that's emergency law. There's no coming back historically from emergency law. Lou Rockwell already stressed since way before COVID that crisis will be the way that the powers that be take away fundamental rights. I was immediately deplatformed. And not only that, there was a global smear campaign coordinated. And that's where my Wikipedia page comes from, which changed overnight to conspiracy theorists. I, know, I now know AI can do this. I didn't at that time know that AI can change journalism around the world. Newspapers, uh, uh, networks where I'd been a fixture for three and a half decades, I was a non-person, they wouldn't talk to me, they, places I had columns, The Guardian, The Sunday Times of London, ran hit pieces on how I was now a QAnon sympathizer. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and they literally, I was a columnist for them. I mean, they literally had been seeking out my opinion, you know, since the 90s. So, so this was all very striking to me and very weird, but I knew that I had to keep reporting the threats to liberty and to humanity that I was seeing. Um, and so that changed my life. Uh, I got exiled overnight from my cozy perch as a liberal commentator. I got disinvited from all the galas. I was told I was no longer welcome. My friends broke up with me. Family members left me and my husband, who was equally, you know, unacceptably asking questions. Um, we were not allowed to come to the Thanksgiving table. Christmases were canceled. Um, it was very painful. But who became my new friends? libertarians and conservatives. <laughs> and then I just want to share quickly some of the um, experience of having long-standing assumptions and beliefs that I thought formed the basis of my understanding of the world collapse and then get rebuilt in a different way because of my having these new conversations. I was um, invited by Jeffrey Tucker to be a fellow at AIER, which is a libertarian think tank. And I, I was like nervous. The, at that time, I still thought I was a liberal. And someone asked me a question about capitalism and I gave my liberal answer and I braced because I thought, okay, now I'll be frozen out or I'll be disinvited, no one will talk to me. And I remember this look of like open curiosity and a follow-up question, why, you know, why do you think that? And I, I thought, this is so surreal. We're not fighting. We're just ex exchanging civil views out of a, a desire to understand each other better. And I literally hadn't had that kind of conversation since the 70s on the left. I am not kidding. Um, I, you know, then many, many similar conversations uh, led me to re, you know, re-examine everything I believed. And I, for example, I remember the moment in which I realized that even capitalism at its worst, even a free market economy with all of its injustices and, you know, Dickensian horrors, would give women more autonomy and self-direction and agency than a centrally planned economy. And like I'd been a famous feminist for 35 years and had not figured that out or been allowed to figure it out. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoy videos like this, please subscribe and hit the notification bell.